Hello, and welcome to Curiosity. It's been a long trip getting up here to the Hinsdale House in Hinsdale, New York, in Cattaraugus County. It's been a very wintry morning, more so than usual for this uh, April date, even though it's, you know, snows in Buffalo a lot into April and sometimes into May, June, July, August, and September. Today, the adventure, before we even got here, led me up a hill that was the wrong hill, so I was getting disoriented, and as I was on the hill, my vehicle would no longer go up and started sliding sideways backwards. So I had no choice being by myself because the other true crew took the tank and came up in the tank to put it in reverse and back up a half a mile down a curvy hill to safety of sorts. But at that point I had to call for rescue, park my van down by the creek where they're all trout fishing right now, and uh, buddy Tim Shaw came down with the crew to pick me up fill me with coffee and bring me to this, the Hinsdale House, which has had more than that of a perilous story in its uh, duration. So join me and knock on the door and see if I can get a hold of the owner, Mr. Dan Class, and we'll get the show going. Thanks. So I'd like to introduce you to Dan Class, the current owner of Hinsdale House, and I'm going to have a few questions for him. And I'm going to start off, if, Dan, if you could take us back to the beginning, the origin of all that happened with this house, what is the, the history of this house? Well, I mean, it's still, I'm still researching it. I mean, it th seems like every week something new is popping up, um, but there's a lot more than everybody thinks. Everybody knows about the exorcism in 1973. Um, I mean, this house dates back to the Seneca Indians, the land, um, and there's a lot to try to find out about this. I mean, it's I, I, what's happening here doesn't have to do with this house. I think it has to do more with what's happening on the outside of the house. There's a war fought on this land, and um, like I said, we're learning more and more about this uh, as we go along. So, it, the kind of the beginning of the written history of what of what would be the hauntings of this house seem to start with the dandies, and they were kind of in the 70s. So for people that aren't familiar with that whole experience and that exorcism, can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, just from reading up on it and, uh, you know, watching the shows and basically I have a, a, some manuscripts from, from back and forth from Clara that with Father Tabolt at St. Bonaventure University. Something happened here. Um, and obviously there's a film crew from New York City that came in to film it. I'm trying to get my hands on that. Hopefully we'll have that soon. Um, but it's uh, they performed a live exorcism in this house actually, and um, you know ever since then it's been known as the exorcism house. You know the, that everybody knows about this house. There's so much curiosity about this house. Uh, what happened? There's and, and researching it, there's there's so much more. I mean, there's so much more that happened on this property, um, dating back to, to the 1800s even. You know like. Um, we have evidence of a little boy being killed in 1942 from a buzzsaw over by the barn where the pond is now. Uh, the Hinsdale hanging tree was on the property on the outer corner of the property where they used to hang people. And there's a, you know, a woman that was hung there that was pregnant. And it's, it's funny because we find, you know, different teams coming in here catching pictures of a woman in white walking around the pond and on the outside of the house. Um, people say there's a little kids running around. I mean, it's, it's, it's unbelievable the amount of evidence different teams are getting, you know, coming in here. It's amazing. I know when I had read um, and seen interviews with people that uh, documented Father Al Alphonse Trabolt coming in and, and doing that, it's interesting because that was sanctioned, wasn't it? Yes. The Catholic Church actually said, yes, go there and take care of this, take care of these people. And the accounts that I've read indicating the house basically moaning and shaking on its foundation and all kinds of things, so it would be... Amazing if you could get the footage that was here from that. Well, I, we've, we've, I think we've pinpointed where it is. Now it's just getting it. So. Wow. so post the dandies and post the exorcism, apparently that didn't do much to squash what was happening here. It just seems to be bigger than that event. So after the dandies uh, had their experience here, now did they have anybody that passed in the house? as well i'm not 100 percent sure because i know that there's there's stories of like a young, like a teenage girl that's seen here mm -hmm. um well laura had died but not in the house okay but, oh that's right yeah she hadn't died in the house but people think that she came back here 
She loved this place. And that was Laura Dandy? Yes. Okay, so she off the property but has still been seen here. Yes. And the recollections that I've heard from people firsthand were that she seemed kind of pleasant. Yes. You know? Mm -hmm. And uh, up on the stairs and very real, like very in front of your face. Um, it's, it's super interesting. Yeah, I also, I mean, just in the research that I've done, there was a family that lived here, the Misnicks, mm -hmm. and uh, Flo loved this place. Um, they actually lived in in the house and, and you know until they till they died, and I believe she's still here. I mean, I've had I think I've had direct communication with her, and it's uh, pretty cool. Now I've heard, and maybe I'm wrong with this, but that the Misnicks kind of said nothing really happened here to the press, mm -hmm. but then after right. the fact said, okay, you know, let me tell you what happened here. Yeah. So so activity continued on throughout the eras. Yes, and I you know it was hard because when the house was deeded to the Reeses in the 19, late 1960s, mm -hmm. um, it's hard because they use this as a rental property. So to try to find all the families that actually tried to live here, um, it's hard. But I'll tell you what, since it's come into the limelight, I have people saying, I lived there for six months. I had to, I, I, you know, we left all of our stuff and got out of there, we couldn't stay there. You know, I, I, I lived there for in the 1983, you know, I just had one just recently said they lived here from 1983 to 1984. So I mean, it's cool because we can continue to research what happened after that. You know? I remember seeing uh, an episode of a local show, and it had a truck driver talking about backing into his dog. Mm -hmm. Maybe you remember that one, but perhaps that was one of the people that kind of came and went. Yep. Um, aside of all that, moving forward, how exactly did you get involved with the house, and how did you become the owner of Hinsdale House? Well, I mean, I, I first came here um, 2011, and then in 2012 again. And, you know, I was very interested in it just because of the whole aspect of the exorcism, just probably like anybody else, you know. Um, again, come back here, talking to the people that used to run the house and learning some of the history of the house. Um, it intrigued me. You know, I just felt, like, drawn to the place. Um, and then when the house was going through what it was going through with the foreclosure and whatnot, um, I said, geez, Michelle, the, the house manager that helps me out here, she kept saying, you know, you need to get this house, you need to get this house. I'm like, uh, I'm going to try. So I put my name in the hat. You know, I, I said, if the, anything happens with the foreclosure or anything happens with, you know, because they wanted to tear it down again. You know, all the ductwork was ripped out of here and they wanted to subpartial the land out, you know, and make more money that way. Why why keep a old beat up house, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, I got a call. I, di I didn't think anything was going to happen. I got a call three months down the road saying, um, you know, if you're interested, stop down in Cuba and Let's see if, see what we can do to get this to work for you. And uh, it, it was tough because like two weeks before that, I just closed on my house with my family. But we made it work. You know, we, we got it to work and uh, immediately started putting some, you had, uh, there's some immediate things that needed to be done to the house in order to keep it viable. Uh, new roof, uh, kitchen ceiling had to be replaced. Uh, the windows are all going to have to be done now. I got to get a new heating system put in here. But I mean, my ultimate goal is to not live here. Um, but renovate it to a point where it wasn't as glory days and allow uh, people to come in, researchers to come in and have it as a paranormal research facility for people, you know. Mm -hmm. it's, it, it's, it's a good place because stuff happens here all the time. It seems like it. I think you just said you were drawn to it, which seems to be a recurring theme with a lot of people. Yeah. Like a lot of local uh, investigators and some outside, I've heard them say multiple times, that they're drawn to this place for whatever reason, they keep coming back. I've been here several times myself. I've had a lot of interesting experiences. Um, it definitely has an energy to it. It does, uh, and I think it helped. Whatever it, whatever it was, it was meant to be. It was. It just happened for a reason. Because so, yeah. it closes on two houses in two weeks. Yeah, exactly. So, and, you know, and on the on the drawn topic, you just had Nick Groff here from Paranormal Lockdown. Yep. And you're in communication with him, and he's telling you that there is still he's still being affected by this place. And they were here what last fall? Yeah, last October. We just saw I just saw the episode on uh, that channel, and it was it was very good. I think they did a good job. It was interesting, and but you could tell it's a very similar reaction to a lot of people that come here. You know, maybe a little bit more intense at times. Right. But um, so I don't know, has he talked at all about how it's affecting him since? I think he's okay now. Um, he went through a cleansing process, um, but he said that the house was calling to him before he even got here. Mm -hmm. You know, and uh, I, something went home with him. 
Um, since then, we've had EVPs after he left saying, where's Nick? You know, like, so whatever whatever was attached to him knows who he is. It's a, it's a smart entity. That seems to be a recurring theme, too, with a lot of uh, investigations and investigators. People, his spirit understands who's coming before they even get there. It's just all-encompassing. Yeah. On the, regarding the house side of things, you said that you have a group of volunteers that kind of helps with all the aspects of it. I know you mentioned you got a new roof and it must be a lot of maintenance here. So you have people that come out and assist. It's amazing. You say the house, you know, the house draws you in. Um, you know, I, I couldn't do it with everybody without everybody's help. You know, there, I, I, people think I'm nuts for getting this place because it needs, it's a cash cow. It needs a lot of, a lot of uh, renovation work. It, you know, I have the house, the deed dating back to 1870 and it was built prior to that. So just imagine the upkeep on something like that. But I had a, uh, I just said, Michelle's like, well, let's do a day of caring and see what happens, right? Almost 70 volunteers show up to try to help, you know, they put new screens on the porch, scraped the, the pond side of the house that really needed bad, repainted that, got the new roof done. I mean, it was just, it was an amazing outpour of support from the community that just have questions about the house or they love the place and they just wanted to come and help keep it viable. That's amazing. And yeah. you have a core group of people, is there anybody you wanted to shout out to? Um, well, Michelle. Uh, obviously, she's the heart and soul of this place, Michelle Ball. Um, she's here what, whenever I need her to be. Um, she lives close by, but um, and Ed and Louise are my paranormal investigation team that help run the tours here. Jason Bingenheimer, he helps with maintenance. Um, and uh, Chris, he uh, mows the lawn, so comes up here every other week and mows the lawn for me all the way from Tonawanda. Oh, awesome. Yeah. No need to mow the lawn today. We had no. a nice snowstorm on the way up. That was pretty interesting. In March. Or is yeah. it April? Uh, it's April, it's I think, April. at this point. But <laughs> I'm just losing track of days here. I know. It happens super easy, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. So, Dan, I know you talked a little bit about, you know, your investment in the house, both financially and uh, personally. And I was wondering if you could give us a little bit of insight as to what's happened to you spiritually or, you know, on the paranormal end since you've been in the house during your investigations. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, just about a year or so ago, we were doing an investigation here and it was going through the foreclosure process. There was no electricity in the house and nothing was really happening. You know, we were getting stuff on the outside of the house, but we weren't getting anything inside of the house. And uh, we were in the kitchen and um, I just, out on a whim, I called the name Flo out. And I had the K2 meter in my hand and the thing just started going off all the way to the red and it takes a ton of energy. And you can put that up to a fuse box and you're not gonna get mm -hmm. uh, a red light on a, a K2 meter. Um, so I had a conversation with, I believe to be Flo Misnick, you know, who was here in the 80s after the dandies. She loved this place. I asked her to follow me up the stairs, um, hold my hand, follow me up the stairs. And the, the thing stayed lit all the way up the stairs till I got to the top. It was the most, it was the coolest experience I've ever had with a K2 meter. The you know my go I had goosebumps the whole time. Um, as soon as I crossed the threshold in the you know what's called Mary's room, um, the energy was gone. I couldn't fi couldn't get it back. Couldn't find it again. Couldn't call out to her to come back. It just seemed like it was a dead zone walking into that room. So that was a really cool experience that I had personally here. Um, we also immediately after that, Louis Louis Caffarella, uh, photographer at my team, he likes to come in and plaster the place with pictures, and. Uh, on the stairs, you, can, you know, this picture he took, uh, you can see legs walking up the stairs, ghostly legs walking up the stairs. Amazing. Really cool. I know you mentioned goosebumps, you know, and I've had them a couple of times already here today. And I believe it was last summer, maybe uh, in July, I was here with, you know, Tim Shaw and you were here and there was a bunch, a group of people, uh, Joe Pieri was here with doing an investigation and a filming, and maybe it was for, uh, Paranormal Crossroads Live or something, but regardless, we were all here, the energy was really high, and everybody was kind of separated and doing their investigation, and it was such a beautiful night. The fields all around this place were loaded with fireflies, it was stars like crazy, it was just magical, and exactly what you're talking about with the, um, the uh, device, the K2s, was happening for about two hours, no power in the house whatsoever, Everybody's K2s were maxing out inside outside Nobody could figure out what was going on and I remember somebody went to their vehicle and brought back like an electrician's kit to test to make sure there was no power coming through and There was no power anywhere 
and then all at once Done. it just all stopped everybody's stopped and it's like what causes that you know i've yeah. heard uh possibility of like ley lines under the the land um that the whole land like you said does have some energy on its own that, like you mentioned the uh, native american like the, the wars and the things that happen here uh the hills do seem to have their own life to them they talk to you they do what yeah. have they said to you well I, it, there, there's been times where i've been here alone mm -hmm. in the middle of the night and I just walk outside and it's this calming peacefulness it just sounds like they're whispering like they're i don't know what they're saying um you know, Clara said she heard chanting. Yeah, I believe I've heard that as well. It the just monk sounds. Chanting. Yeah, it's, it's it's weird. Like, I don't know. It, it can freak you out, or it can be so peaceful. You know, like either way. You know, it's it's like this odd. Ba well, actually, it's like a perfect balance of like security and peace, and you know, then you have the other side of the unknown and whatever is strong enough to want to pull people back here. You know, it's intriguing. Well, yeah. that's why I do what I do. Yeah. Find the unknown. I want to know what happens when we die, you know? Me too. Yeah. I think that, I think we're going to be on our way with the new scientific research and um, all the new equipment that's coming out. I think that we're on our way. Right. I think that it's uh, coming into the limelight, so. So as far as, as far as the house goes, what's in store for it for the future, the near future and the far future? Well... Thanks to Paranormal Lockdown, within a week we've scheduled 40 investigations and tours. Um, it's going to totally help get, get us up to par with what we need to be done with this house. Um, first things, we need to get a heating system put in before the next winter. Um, all the windows are going to be replaced um, with plexiglass windows um, as opposed to the glass so they can't be broken. Uh, we're going to scrape and repaint the whole house at the end of this month, hopefully, weather pending. Um, but i got a team of people coming up here to do that. And then I'd like to take back more of the land. You know, it's all overgrown mm -hmm. um, around the pond. So we're going to work on taking back the land as well. That's eight acres of stuff that could be explored still, you know. That's excellent. Yeah. And if somebody or a team wanted to get a hold of you or uh, figure out how to come here and investigate on their own, how do they go about doing that? Well, I'm pretty easy to get a hold of. If you put my name in Google, Dan Class, K-L-A-E-S. Uh, my phone number just pops up. You can call me. Um, but uh, it, more importantly, we have a, a website, hauntedhinsdalehouse.com. You can go to there. There's a little form that you can fill out and request an investigation uh, or a tour. Uh, and we'll, we'll do them whenever we can. You know, so. That's awesome. Hinsdale House. It's a very interesting place. Lots of activity. I've never been here where at least something interesting didn't happen or at least goosebumps. Or, you know, you see the darkness out of the corner of your eye moving across the room specifically even in this room like in that corner moving around up the stairs um and you know you can get more of a dose on it if you haven't heard of this place yet on that paranormal lockdown episode of the hinsdale house um it's very interesting yeah it gives truth to what's happened here so very cool and i was here for the filming so i, I know that there's no embellishment going on with that i mean they literally stayed in this house for three days and uh it's crazy that's crazy it, you know the theory i guess this theory is the longer you stay the more you're going to catch and it's the truth i mean who has the opportunity to go to a haunted location stay for three days yeah. straight you know what i mean so the evidence that they're catching is aston aston astounding you know absolutely so dan i know you've mentioned on facebook um that you're going to be writing a book, and is the book have to do with this residence? Yes, and the land and the history. Um, I want to be able to tell, there's been books written about the exorcism and what happened. I want to be able to tell the story of what I've researched of the land um, and the history of the house prior to the dandies uh, and what's happened since the dandies have left. I have so much information, you know, that I, I have, my editor tells me I need 20 chapters, I could probably write 50. So, but we're we're pushing for a deadline of July 1st to get it to my editor, and then uh, hopefully by the fall we'll have the book out. It's going to be called The Hinsdale House in American Haunting. That's excellent. It's yes. one of the most, if not the most haunted house in the United States. Yeah. It's going to be fantastic. Even before um, this kind of came to light with Paranormal Lockdown, I mean, this was always known as the Amityville of Western New York area, yes. Cattaraugus County. Mm hmm So, yeah. 
So, Dan, I wanted to say thank you very much um, from the bottom of my heart for being on this episode of Curiosity. Like, we've been friends for a long time, and I love what you're doing with this house, and I love what you're doing with the paranormal community and the investigations, and I love your concept of finding out what happens next. So, again, thank you very much uh, for this insight on the Hinsdale House, and thank you for watching this episode of Curiosity at the Hinsdale House in Cattaraugus County, New York. Again, if you want to talk to Dan about getting a tour of the house or booking an evening, you can check it out at www.hauntedhinsdalehouse.com. Excellent. Thank you very much, and you guys have a great night. Oh